As always each year, it's great to see the Melbourne Queer Film Festival is approaching. In fact, it will be happening from the 14th to the 24th of November at uh, four venues. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the program director uh, of MQFF, Cerise Howard. Cerise, welcome again to Movie Metropolis. Thanks, Peter. Lovely to be back. Now, this year you've titled the um, the whole uh, festival as Formative Sound mm -hmm. and Vision. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's a, a theme that, um, look, it can be interpreted in a very broad sense to speak to everything cinematic and, and how the moving image uh, in combination with sound, basically the, the meat and potatoes of cinema, uh, can help us um, uh, figure out who we are and, and be the making of us in a sense. But it is uh, especially in reference also to the influence that uh, that music has had on many queer people and especially the video, uh, the music video and, and other uh, imagery uh, attached to um, musicians, especially of the popular persuasion, um, especially from the 80s onwards, the, the influence that has had on the culture very broadly, but on queer folk finding themselves um, with the advent of the music video and its enormous uh, popularity and reach from the early 80s onwards in particular, uh, there was just an extraordinary inundation into households the world over of very matter-of-factly queer imagery associated with the pop stars of the time, uh, often, often um, not read as such necessarily at the time. Um, many of the pop stars of the era were closeted. Um, it was still quite a taboo for anyone involved in the music industry to be out, let alone proud. But the, the music video was a very queer art form from the get-go. So sort of reaching into some of these hidden histories of, of musicians of note. We've got a number of um, music documentaries in the program celebrating the likes of Little Richard, who people didn't twig was queer, which just seems remarkable in hindsight, uh, or Linda Perry from Four Non Blondes, um, who's had a huge career as a singer, um, but moreover as a songwriter and producer subsequent to that band's breakout success, or documentaries on um, uh, the likes of our opening night um, focus, uh, Jackie Shane, an extraordinary soul singer who, as a person of colour, was very pioneering as a, a trans performer before the language really existed to match their identity uh, in 50s Nashville and then into 60s Toronto. And uh, her story is absolutely incredible. And that film is, is beautiful and the perfect film to launch this year's festival. Um, and I should add that this theme was also quite heavily inspired by a particular book that I uh, devoured last year um, from Daryl W. Bullock named David Bowie Made Me Gay, 100 Years of LGBT Music, uh, which is a, a treasure trove of information about the often hidden histories of musicians throughout the 20th century uh, and their, their queerness, sometimes hitherto unknown or un -red, not registered, um, but now coming to the, the foreground. And uh, Daryl will be a guest of the festival this year. Okay, and uh, I'm glad you've mentioned the opening night film. It sounds really um, quite uh, fascinating. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, th there's a huge number of films, documentaries, feature films, short films, as always, uh, excellent to see. Any challenges in finding uh, films, especially, I, I must add, a few older films, retrospectives and so on? Yeah, we well, wanted a few older films uh, to speak to this particular theme. Um, and uh, attached to this thematic of formative sound and vision, uh, there's very much the uh, an association in the minds of many of the, the genre of the musical uh, association with that, with queer culture. But when you actually look into that a little deeper, you, you, you clock that 
historically not a tremendous number of musicals have actually foregrounded queer characters and lives. There's this real link with queer spectatorship and participation in musicals on screen and on stage, but fewer films that really uh, speak to, to queerness. So, and, and you know, the most famous of them all is the Rocky Horror Picture Show has so long been, um, I wouldn't quite say appropriated by straight culture, but it's become so such a, a mainstream phenomenon. So I thought it important to have a few truly profoundly queer musicals uh, in the program. And that meant going back into film history as well as spotlighting a few brand spanking new ones. So yes, we have Can't Stop the Music in the program as um, the Village People movie, as also as a tribute to the late and um, much uh, lamented uh, Lee Gambon, a film historian locally, who one of his last uh, jobs he undertook uh, as a prolific contributor to home theatrical releases was a, a commentary track on a, a Blu-ray release of Can't Stop the Music. Um, but we also have Rosa von Pronheim's uh, extraordinary 80s Berlin set musical, um, City of Lost Souls. Mm. And um, and then uh, this uh, absolutely extraordinary rediscovery, a 1972 film called Scarecrow in a Garden of Cucumbers, starring Warhol superstar Holly Woodlawn, who is utterly transfixing in the lead role of a small town girl let loose in New York City, who then uh, embarks upon a series of fairly unhinged escapades. <laughs> it's um, an enormously entertaining, truly singular film that just disappeared from sight for about 50 years. Uh, and it also marks the first contribution to the cinema of both Bette Midler and Lily Tomlin, who can both be heard on the soundtrack. Um, so yes, there's uh, there are all those uh, older films. Uh, in terms of how it is to find films in the, the current current day, um, I had the, the good fortune to be able to get a head start on programming this year by attending the Berlin Ali as a juror on the Teddy Awards there, their uh, queer film prize. So there's a good few films from the Berlin program in this year's festival, including an extraordinary new musical called Rias from Argentina which I was astonished after seeing it there to learn was um, up for a Teddy Award in the documentary slash essay film category, when to all extents and purposes, it, it was a musical and is a musical and seemed to have fictional elements, but later learnt it was largely, if not entirely, the work of people with experience of incarceration, uh, women and trans people um, who, I don't know if this was made as a, a rehabilitation exercise somehow, and therefore that's how it's a, a documentary. Uh, I think it's just plainly a, a perfectly queer film. It queers genre. It's an extraordinary hybrid, um, and it gets to have its Australian premiere with us, which I'm extremely thrilled about. I was also lucky to be able to attend the Frameline Queer Film Festival in San Francisco in, in June, and that's the, the world's longest running queer film festival. It turned 48 this year uh, and so that was a, a very helpful uh, means of seeing a whole lot of the the latest greatest queer cinema as well as some great retrospective titles that's where i uh, saw scarecrow in a garden of cucumbers uh, amongst other other older and wonderful films um but then the rest of it's hunting through the usual channels uh, looking at other festival programs, just contacting sales agents, distributors, archives, signing up to mailing lists, just trying to keep my ear to the ground and and uh, and battling uh, because there's uh, there are any number of other festivals that these days don't balk in the slightest at screening queer films. So, um, but fortunately, there are a lot more queer films of quality made around the world now. So there is enough to go around. <laughs> Good to hear and uh, and well done on all of that. Now, I notice that the centrepiece uh, presentation mm. is a film called Gondola. Mm. Yeah, I, I adore this film. Um, it's a, a Georgian-German co-production and it's... It, it, uh, <laughs> 
has a, a very unique relationship to the thematic in this year's festival. It's a very, very particular sort of combination of sound and vision. It is a film that, well, I don't think it's spoiling it in any way to, to acknowledge this, but there is um, there's not a single word of dialogue uttered in the entire film, and yet the sound in it is extremely integral to the storytelling. It's about two gondola attendants, and by gondola here we're not talking about the Venetian sense of the word, but more these little cabins in the sky that um, there, there are two of them and they, they one goes one way across a valley, quite vast valley, and the other goes the other way and they always uh, cross briefly. There's a moment where they're aligned um, with each journey across the valley from either direction. Uh, and these two young women uh, embark upon ever more ingenious ways of um, uh, having these sort of mid-air flirtations with one another. It's incredibly charming, witty, um, funny, and and musical. Um, yeah, and not a word of dialogue, not a one. Okay, sounds good. And, yeah, it and, is. It's terrific. Yeah. Um, I, I like this diversity of programming that uh, we have such a wide range of types of films as well, which is fantastic. And I noticed that the closing night film uh, is called Duino. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's it's one of those films that people who are into film are always going to be especially drawn to. Um, I mean, it's going to draw, I, I'm sure, a, a heavy audience is from uh, the the gay male crowd in particular has lots of uh, uh, it's well very attractive human beings in the cast in this one um but it's also a film about film it's a film about a filmmaker uh, experiencing uh, sort of a nostalgic but uh, bittersweet um reflection of time spent on the adriatic coast um Italy near the Croatian border, um, I think it's the Croatian border, um, back to university days and uh, a relationship that fermented in those heady times that is largely captured on film. And so we have the film within the film and sort of a film within a film within a film without it getting all insufferably meta. It's instead very, very sweet and um, a, a really lovely way just to to close the festival out with a, a film that is both deeply romantic uh about about human relationships uh as well as about the cinema itself okay very good now i noticed that uh marco berger is back uh oh, with yes. a, yeah with another film the astronaut lovers yeah yeah well burke is a uh, burger is a, a festival favorite uh a queer f festival favorite um and as as has been his want for some time with the astronaut lovers he's uh he's got this p particular interest in seeing how gay males and and straight males might relate to one another and whether where the breaking points are between simple binaries like that there, there's um it seems to be an ongoing obsession of his to to just probe away at um at the the i don't know if boundaries is necessarily the word that people set for themselves or at least perhaps interrogate the nature of those boundaries and whether there might might be a little more fluidity to them than some people sometimes um would imagine and this is a, a playful quite comedic film uh certainly not as heavy as his uh immediately prior feature um, uh, horseplay, but it's still um, still got the Marco Berger touch. Uh, and certainly, again, many very attractive human beings on screen. I've also got a new short, a, a very playful new short from him in the program called The Exchange. But to say too much about, about that one would really lean into spoiler territory, but it, it, it does actually break a little bit of new ground for him, I'll just say that much. Okay.
Again, very mm. good. Now, a title that uh, really intrigued me is uh, a film called Carnage for Christmas. Ah, yes. Well, yes. Um, Alice Meyer McKay is uh, an Australian filmmaker. This is her, her latest film. She's very much uh, working in the horror genre and very explicitly making films uh, that uh, are labelled even in the opening titles as queer and or transgender horror films. And extraordinarily, this is her fifth feature. I don't think she's quite yet turned 20 years of age. I think she's still a teen. Um, we had two of her films last year, Tea Blockers and Satranic Panic. Uh, this year's film, uh, Carnage for Christmas, she's teamed up with Vera Drew, who has um, become another extremely notable young trans filmmaker who's enjoyed a degree of notoriety with The People's Joker. And Vera Drew is the editor of Carnage for Christmas. And between the pair of them, they've made this very entertaining uh, sort of fish out of water horror film with a, a Christmassy theme uh, about small town um, Australia and returning to it when you've left it for some time only to uh, become embroiled uh, in uh, some sort of serial killer goings on linked to traumatic histories. Um, it, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, Alice is an extraordinary talent and uh, she'll be a guest of the festival this year. Ah, Again. Excellent. Excellent to hear. Now, a film I have seen is Marcello Mio, uh, Christophe mm -hmm. Honoré's film, which is uh, mm -hmm. such a, a fascinating look at uh, Chiara Mastriani and her transition to become Marcello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is quite irresistible, especially if you're the least bit film buffy. Um, so yes, Chiara, the the daughter of not just Marcello Mastroani, but the uh, legendary Cutter and Deneuve, who plays herself, or I don't know how loosely, how heavily fictionalized version of herself, but uh, there is a lot of joy to be had watching her try to come to terms with her daughter ostensibly becoming her um, one-time famous partner. I mean, it, the, probably the the uh, greatest glamour couple in cinema for a period there, and especially in European cinema. And uh, Chiara really gives herself over to this wholesale, and it really leans into some very uncanny territory. She really comes to resemble her father, Marcello Mastroani, mm. very uncannily and, and has a lot of fun with that. And the, the film really plays with its audience a lot too. We, we don't know how seriously to take her. No one in the film knows how seriously to take her. Uh, and it's just the, the joy of drag, um, but in a direction, in the drag kinging direction rather than drag queen direction, which is a lot less explored in film. So yeah, super fun. I, I trust you enjoyed it too, Peter? I did, I did. I, mm. I, I was marvelling at uh, the depiction, especially of uh, uh, Catherine Deneuve's character and uh, and how much of it was uh, close to the truth and how much yeah. of it was yeah. fabricated. So anyway, fascinating film. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I noticed a Canadian film called Close to You. Yes. Um, so yes, Elliot Page, um, probably the highest profile trans masculine person on the planet in 2024, but largely absent from screens for several years. Um, I mean, obviously they've had a bit going on. And when I say that, I don't just mean in terms of their own personal journey, but actually Elliot's been very busy as a producer of films too. And, and Page Boy Productions, um, Elliot's company is uh, a producer of our opening night film, Any Other Way, The Jackie Shane Story, as well as another film in the program this year, Backspot, which is a really fun, queer, cheerleading film. Uh, so uh, Close to You is very appreciably a film that's very important to Elliot. They play a character who is it's something of a homecoming narrative, um, a setup that can always be fraught with complications for trans people coming 
back into the the home uh, to, to family. Um, it's uh, a film that there's been a yeah, there's quite a, a degree of improvisation that uh, is key to the performance and the the honesty of the film. There's there's a rawness to it, and I. I it's a film where the, the style of filmmaking, that manner of really leaning into improv, um, speaks to the, I think, the real life uh, awkwardness of a lot of exchanges between trans people who are fairly early on into the transition or and, and really still new to really asserting that newer identity. Um, you know, that awkwardness they can feel as people close to them have to adjust. Um, so I think it's a really important film in many respects, not just for its its star, Elliot Page, but also just, um, yeah, as, as it's, as someone now who is, who has that extremely high profile as a, an out trans person in Hollywood, it's just a, an important step. I think for representation. Okay, fair enough. Such a huge program. Just to uh, briefly mention uh, documentaries, of course, as well, but short films in particular, and there's uh, Australian short films too. Yes, every year there's the we have a a package of Australian shorts and awards. There are a number of awards up for grabs, um, and that's always a big night every year at the festival. But that's not the only outlet for the Australian short filmmakers too. Their their films are dotted throughout uh, as many as twelve in cinema shorts packages and thirteen online because we actually uh, compile a, an additional one for our online component. We have a, a streaming platform as well called MQFF Plus. So uh, the the extra one there being uh, a compilation of shorts that we we run a few before features during the festival. So make sure that people can catch those online as well. And there's just, um, I mean, look, it's no secret that there's a lot of talent in Australia and um, there's a lot of queer talent amongst that. And the, I mean, it's not for me to, to try to express any uh, favoritism about that selection. That's, um, cause that's, that would be inappropriate right now. Uh, but on the, the final Saturday in the festival, that's the 23rd, we will have our glorious glittering uh, night of nights, our shorts and awards ceremony at Acme, which is also our, our festival hub this year and where we'll have a, a lounge where people can come and hang out and um, line up some uh, bangers on the video jukebox that we will have in there. And, and even if they wish, um, engage in some karaoke of a Saturday night. <laughs> Fair enough. And apart from Acme, you've also got the Capitol uh, mm -hmm. Cinema, the Nova and the Como Cinema. Yes, yes. Um, so we've got the North and the South, uh, you know, key venues on either side of the Yarra. And um, you know, we've returned to Acme and using both of their cinemas throughout the festival as well as having the, the lounge there and, of course, the capital, the glorious Capitol Theatre, 100 years young this year. And uh, that's the 14th to the 24th of November. And mqff.com.au is the website. And you've got an excellent uh, elaborate program as well, which uh, uh, with a tear out section so people can easily schedule their screenings. Yes, yes, because there, there is a lot there to to um to uh to try to make sense of. I, I just urge people to take their their time just to go through the program. There are a lot of sessions, just over a hundred. About I think there are sixty one feature length films, inclusive of nineteen documentaries, and even some of those documentaries uh, are they truly documentaries in a conventional sense? Not really. Um, uh, and yeah, a lot of shorts. So yeah, it's a big program. Um, so uh, you, folks, if you can't get hold of the print copy, you can find it all on the website. You can actually download that program as a PDF as well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, there are lots of passes to get the good deals. So buy in bulk, save money, see many films, have fun. 
Absolutely. Suri's excellent mm. stuff. And I'll just very quickly finish off with the question, which I think you know I'm going to ask. Apart from what's mm. in the festival, have you seen anything of late that impressed you? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, as you know, Peter, I'm a, one of the curators of the Melbourne Cinematheque. And yep. on Wednesday, just gone, I had the, the joy of being introduced to a filmmaker I knew nothing about, a Greek filmmaker named uh, Nikos Kundoros. It might not be very well pronounced. Um, I'd never seen his work before and, and saw a, um, an excellent film called The Magic City, I think from the 50s, set in Athens, but not in a particularly glamorous part of Athens. Very much a film inspired by Italian neorealism. And uh, yeah, fascinating. Um, I wish I'd seen the the rest of that season. There were four films in it, um, so yeah, that's. Otherwise, I mean, I'm I'm not finding a ton of time to see films outside mm -hmm. of uh, queer film festival duties. But I did also check in on my good old friends at the Czech and Slovak Film Festival, who just had their twelfth edition, uh, just finished last weekend, and I saw a couple of goodies there as well. Um, Two stunning animated works by Yerji Bata, The Pied Piper and The Vanished World of Gloves, um, which I believe are now going to be released on Blu-ray through Deaf Crocodile in the States. Um, highly recommended. Okay, excellent recommendations. And certainly we recommend the Melbourne Queer Film Festival and uh, 14th to the 24th of November. And we've been speaking to Cerise Howard, who is the Program Director of MQFF. Cerise, as always, thanks so much for talking with me. Pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. Bye-bye.